You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is the first question and answer episode of 2020. Holy cow. 2020, dude. We weren't supposed to live that long. I didn't think I was going to live this long. Yeah, right. I made it to 40. <laughs> Listen, let's be honest. I ain't making it to 50. I'm not making it to 2030. You'll like limp what's the, it. You'll what's, like, the over un, what's the over under for 2030 for me? 2030? Oh, you'll be there. You'll just have like one leg amputated below the knee. So and here's be on like I had a stroke and like the right side of your face. Will no, be no, listen that. Well, okay. So we've talked about, you know, uh, I haven't, I don't, this is not a sad thing. I haven't given an update on my dad in a while. I've seen my dad a few times, uh, in the last week and a half. Cause it's the holidays, you know, so I went and saw my dad. I had some decent meetings with my dad. My dad has kind of got into that. Uh, you know, he did the one year ago, yeah. he did the massive nosedive. We put him in, we put him in hospice and he basically did an insane nosedive till March or April or May of 2019, and then he sort of like stabilized. Guy weighs like 148 pounds, went in at 235. Yeah. Now, here's the crazy thing. So 148 pounds for a guy that's weighed 235 for the last 30 years, he looks like, he lo- he looks like a cancer patient or an AIDS patient or a concentration camp victim. I mean, like the guy's, like he's ill. Mm-hmm. Um but 140, there are a lot of 147 pound men that we get even in online coaching that are they're alive, and so the guy, the guy. Well, I mean, and what, and here's the thing, here's, well, I mean, the the crazy thing is like my dad, my dad is at this point where he weighs just a pound or two under 150. So his doctor's and like, your BMI is perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's terrible. Uh, he had to have two teeth extracted the last oh, month. Oh gosh! And the guy didn't know what's going on, you know. So they yeah. got to like take him in an ambulance, and they've got to. He had two two abscesses in his teeth, and so it's the the something about the Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia medicine they give him like rot. The the, the the weird side effect is it rots your teeth out. Guys, guys always had great teeth, and like now this medicine's messing his teeth up. But um, he's in this sort of holding pattern, which is a kind of painful thing to see him in because he's. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> you've got a lot of English clients, like British clients, that, right. are, <laughs> that are like 147 pounds. Like, they weigh the same thing as my dad. The weird thing is... Also his, have teeth trouble, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to throw one under the bus, oh, but okay. it's true. No, they have, uh, they have hardy teeth. Uh, interesting thing about my dad that I never noticed is when you're when you're 235 or 240, and the guy, the guy 6'1", he has an enormous rib cage. Yeah. Like he's got a big bone structure. He's got really wide shoulders. And of course, so like no matter how much weight you lose, your shoulders going don't get thinner. And your rib cage doesn't get smaller. So he lays on his back and his rib cage is this massive thing. And it's like the Grand Canyon dropping off his rib cage where his where his belly was. It's it's really it's really bizarre to see. And so yeah, so we we've I've seen him quite a bit. Um he's doing okay. Uh but he's sort of in this holding pattern at this point. Well, it's difficult, man. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it sucks, man. But to bring it back full circle, um, I it's forced me to think about. I don't know how much you've thought about. Like, what is what is if the in, if end of life for you is not good, is difficult. You know, if you don't if you don't die in a car accident or you know charity on top of you or something, which would be a far better way to go. I, I shoot for that every morning. Yeah, that's what that mustache is for. You got that mm-hmm. mustache going on. So just you're giving mustache rides until you die. That's right. But if that's not the way it works, I, I, I've had to I've, I've been confronted with the reality of like what the end of life looks like. And and here here's my opinion on it. And it's not I'm sure it's not the same as everybody. And I don't think this is right or wrong or indifferent. But I t- I've told my wife the few times that my wife has seen my dad this year, which is just three or four times. And my kids have seen her seen him three or four times. Um, if my mind goes, mm-hmm. I'm like, you got to take me to Arizona and put me down. I, I have an uncle who said, who told me 35, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, probably, you know, if my mind starts to go, take me squirrel hunting and right. let me, and let me get out in front and to just blast me. Yeah. Now, now the interesting thing is, is I think if I keep my mind, but my body goes right. So if I get mm-hmm. cancer or something, I think I think I would rather stay if my mind is okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but my body goes. I I can deal with the body. 
the body leaving as long as the brain is okay. But if the brain is not okay, you got you got to you got to end it. And so well, that, we've we've talked through that quite a bit. That stuff's charity's responsibility, which sounds ugly. yeah. But does she but, know? Have yeah. you talked through it with her? Well, yeah. well. Here, here here's what I want her to do. Whatever she needs to do, right? Like if she can't unplug me, then then don't. And sure. then eventually you'll be able to. You know, yeah, we, what, we whatever you need to do, charity. You know to go on you know yeah you know I, I i don't want i don't want i mean it's a very stressful time you get sick you're on death's door whatever the heck it is and now you've got this injunction like hey listen charity you know remember that time we sat down like i'm expecting you to do this and they're already stressed you know and everything's difficult yeah. like you know i'll trust in her judgment she needs it she can do what she what she needs to do and uh it'll, yeah. it'll be it'll be it'll be okay yeah, for me, I think that's, I think right now that's only for if my brain goes. Right. If, if my body goes, I'm like, yeah, my brain is still fine, you know, which, well, is, which is fairly rare. We've kind of, Rachel and I've kind of talked and we've decided that. Oh, you have? Hold yeah. On, you've talked to my wife about this? Yeah, if your body goes, we're going to just, we're just going to have the vet come and just put you down and then we'll, well, bury, you okay. with a, we'll bury you with a backhoe. <laughs> <laughs> it's. it's I feel like, uh, if, but if your mind if, goes, we'll keep you around, and you can like carry things for us. No, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's what, but, but we've <laughs> That's talked about not it. what I want. <laughs> but we've talked about. I want it. the opposite. Oh, <laughs> but I don't. I don't know that I want. Uh, I don't want know that I want the how. Um, <laughs> it could be like an automaton. It's like there's gro- you know get the groceries out of the car. <laughs> you can carry them all in. That's if my mind goes. And my right. worry is that if the bo- if my body is the is the limiting factor. Uh, which it essentially already is <laughs> at forty. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm case. closer. To, I'm closer to. I'm closer to death than I than I want to be. So, well, don't worry about it. Like we we've like I said, we've got it. We've talked it through. Okay, we've good. I'm glad. I'm glad it. you and Rachel have figured this thing out. Let's answer some questions. Peter says missing rectus abdominis muscle belts and training. That's the subject. He says here's a unique one. I have a neighbor who had her femur removed. What? Uh, due to uh, cancer, they re- rebuilt her leg with a steel rod and replaced oh, okay. her rectus femoris muscle with her rectus abdominis muscle. Ooh. She's in her late 40s, early 50s, and wants to stay strong for her young daughter. She walks with a cane and has occasional trouble with hernias, most likely due to her missing abdominal muscles. Certainly. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any suggestions yeah. for modifications for exercises that would help her? Uh, no. Would a belt be enough to prevent hernia? Obviously, nope. you're not doctors. Yeah, we are not doctors, but no, uh, man. Uh, Sure, a, a belt will probably slow the exacerbation of the hernias, but she needs to wear lady, two, like two that, four inch well, belts. <laughs> well, she no, she actually needs probably a, like a Ray Ban ne- neoprene belt underneath yeah. her normal belt. So a, a big wide, you know, like what you see the guys at Home Depot wearing, mm-hmm. with a better version of that. There's there's some big nylon th- wide, you know, they're ten inches ten inches wide belt, and the normal belt on top of it. But look, listen. Hernias are going to come. Yeah, if she's going to lift, and the doctors didn't didn't cover her abdominal wall in mesh, then the doctors are morons. Like that's what she needs. Like she's probably going to get hernias until she's got her abdominal wall covered in mesh, or something that's not going to let hernias poke through. What she didn't yeah. have a she didn't have a she didn't have a muscular wall there. Yeah, there's nothing there. It, then right, piece gosh. of small intestine and stomach are getting pushed through. When they had her open, they should have installed that like day one. Yeah. That's silly. But but I listen. I get it. Like how many people lift? Yep. My my thing is with hernias is that is that lifting. I've said this before. Li- lifting heavy will often exacerbate a hernia that is going to come anyway. Yeah. Meaning that she's going to get it if she sneezes. Oh, or, she's going to get it on the toilet. Or poops, maybe. A, or poops yeah. a little bit. Or picks up, you know, the first hernia. I've had a bunch of hernias. The first hernia I ever got was in the fifth grade, picking up a piano, moving moving across yeah, the country. Yeah, I picked that. up a piano with my brother, and I was in the fifth grade, which was too young to pick up a piano. I got a hernia. It wasn't lifting. So, you know, that stuff's going to happen. Uh, probably the first time she goes and gets surgery for the first hernia, they just need to go ahead and, like, put her from breastbone to bladder. Yeah, there, there's no way around it. Like, a leg press isn't going to help her avoid that. I mean, I can't think no. of anything. She's going to have trouble with that. Uh, just, you know, slow, 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 one pound increments, two pound increments, slow, slow, slow increases. Think, think about the way your abdominal wall feels like, you know, if you ever done a bunch of really heavy squats or really heavy deadlifts and you haven't done them in a while, your abdominals are sometimes sore. 
dude, I squatted a heavy set of five the other day. And my, when I, I racked it and my abs were burning. Yes. But here's the thing. The other day I had um, my CPAP irritated my sinuses the other day. And I sneezed like 200 times in probably a 12-hour period. You, know you get how, rapid. You know, <laughs> you know how sore my abs were the next day? Yeah. So it doesn't matter if she lifts. Like she's going to sneeze or cough or push a little too hard while defecating or something. And it's, it's just she's going to get them. It's just part of the deal. They pull a big giant muscle wall and put it in there for your <laughs> in your leg. That's you're gonna get it. So yeah, it's tough. Um, it, she just got to go really slow, and um, she's got to be conscious of uh, bracing and just being real yep. careful, man. It's, yep. it's unfortunate. But I, but I would use I would use a wide belt and a and a normal belt on top of it. Probably will help slow the yep. issue. Andrew says hi, Scott and Matt from the UK. Wait a minute, we're not from the UK. I guess you are. Is there a UK anymore? There, uh, there is a UK, although is it Wales under the Hamburg Plan, or what is it? they let Scotland out immediately. Scotland is the California of the UK. Okay. And then they go ahead and complete Brexit. And then Italy gets out pretty soon. And then Hungary gets out. And then the, Wait a minute. Then Hold the on. EU's done. No, that's the EU, but the EU and the UK are not the same thing. No, but, but, I, but I'm just telling you. When I, but the, why that's I'm the asking, plan. what is the UK now? Because oh, I actually don't what know. Is it? Is it what is Scotland, it? Wales, and Ireland? Are yeah. all those like part of the UK? I'm yes. Just, people are going to write in. They're going to be like, you're a dumbass. But Britain's not. English, England's not anymore. Yes. Part of the UK. They are yes. part of the UK. Yes. I thought that's what Brexit that's, was. Is they were leaving the, the UK. The UK. No, leaving the EU, the European Union. Okay, so it's not the same. I knew they left the EU too, but so they that's haven't not. Left the, they haven't left the EU. They just voted to, and they just ignored oh, okay. the referendum. So there is still a United Kingdom. That's right. And which is a vassal state of the EU. And it's not like the the like Windsor and the, the royal family is are they the royal family for all of those or no? Is that why it's called the United Kingdom? Yes. Okay. God damn it. Why am I so dumb? I'm sorry. So how'd that work? How'd that work? Uh well, Elizabeth dies and then like they have a bunch of trouble and then James, King of Scotland becomes the king of England. Now wait, why why is there a king of Scotland if there is a queen of England and there's a united kingdom? Well, there was a queen of England and there was Mary Queen of Scots and then there was James that was the king right. of Scotland and he was the next in line because the monarch of England did not have any heirs and he was the next of kin. So he okay. united the thrones of Scotland and the UK under England. one crown. There you go. James. Got it. So there's still king, there's still a royal family in each of these countries. Not in Scotland. Scotland doesn't have a king. Well, they do. It's the king. Of, they're the, the monarch of England. Because they okay, united that, those two. Okay, that's why I'm asking. Yes. Okay, yes, that's yes, why, yes. That's, how, that's why they call it united. What the... F I why am it. I talking about... We, you know, I should stick this is Prince, to and Prince William Is Prince William going to be king? He's got that hot wife. That's the act, that or not the actress. Kate. The Harry's Harry's got the yeah Kate. She's, yeah, she's classy. I hope so. If I would, again, and then Harry's got the actress wife. Yeah, right? yeah. They need to uh, they need to like put him in a catapult and like shoot him over to Iceland or something. Get rid of him. Okay. Okay. But uh, yeah, Harry Harry one day right. Uh, okay. And, but poor Andrew <laughs> says a few weeks ago you mentioned a guy who trained his bench press exclusively with a slingshot because of wrecked shoulders. I have both a slingshot and a wrecked shoulder. I was wondering what kind of routine he did for the bench press using the slingshot. I don't remember saying that. I don't know that we'd, I didn't say it, but I don't remember that. Right. Um, he says he's uh, 58 years old. Okay. And there you go. Yeah. I mean, if you've got, uh, if you do have a wrecked shoulder, you've got a, a rotator cuff problem, especially anterior, then the slingshot can help with that. Uh, you know, our good friend Will Morris likes that for people. He's a he's a good PT, and uh, you put those put those slingshots on, and you can you can do work because it it takes uh, the brunt of the load in the last couple inches with the barbell down by your chest, and so it sort of helps distribute the the load across the the slingshot, and still allows you to get a fair amount of pec work and shoulder work, and lots of tricep work. Lots of tricep work. And so, um, you know, I think if I were going to do it exclusively, I would probably do it in a 
in a DUP style, what I mean is like I would probably train it fairly heavy once a week. I would probably train it with uh, some volume another time a week. And typically, if somebody's got a wrecked shoulder, I would get volume more from the sets than from the reps. So I like things like seven sets of two, seven sets of three, rather than three sets of seven, right? The other yeah, way around. It, especially because with a slingshot, the weight on the barbell will be considerably higher than it would be without the slingshot. Correct. So it's going to yep. be way heavier than your regular bench press would be. Yep. 20 per- 10, 20% higher, yep. heavier, maybe. Yep. So that's that's what I do. I do kind of a volume day and an intensity day with the slingshot. And the volume day, I would, I would get the volume more from sets than from the reps. Um, and that's not a bad way to do it. Yeah, you don't have to worry about too much about programming being different. It's not. It's kind no, of like a close grip bench press with a piece of elastic yeah. on your chest, and yeah. uh, just just do it. It'll be okay. Yeah. It's nothing. Uh, there's nothing mystical or categorically different about using this slingshot. Yep. It just um, it's just some. It's an exoskeleton that will do the work of some of your sh- fucked up shoulder. I'll, I'll tell you. That I don't know that we've ever said this on the podcast, but the, one thing about the slingshot you have to keep in mind is they they tend to stretch out. Mm-hmm. over time and so um if you if you utilize a weight let's say you're you're bench pressing let's say this guy's bench pressing with 225 with the slingshot week one that 225 is a lot lighter in the slingshot than it is on week 10 because yeah. it's elastic and it just stretches over time it doesn't hold the same the same level of stretch um so you've got to think about that over time so if you're like man I, this seems to be getting harder it's getting harder because the slingshot's stretching out take the thing off and you'll notice like, if you if you ever take a you know, you got an old pair of underwear or sweatpants that's got an elastic band on the inside, and you've worn them for three or four years, and that elastic is just sort of like stretched out. And uh, that's the the slingshot will do the same thing. Yeah. Does the slingshot, do you think the slingshot does anything for the shoulder that just a close grip bench press wouldn't do? Um, That's a good question. I mean, what we're doing with the close grip bench press, right, is we're, we're, we're closing the elbow more and opening the shoulder more, right? So we take... Some of the moment off the shoulder and put it on the elbow. Yep. Um, I think it just depends on where the pain is. When I've had true acute pain where I can point to the spot anterior on my shoulder, then I feel like a slingshot tends to feel a much, much better so Matt's than, pointing, than a close grip. Matt's pointing on a place right in the front of his shoulder about two inches about two inches above his armpit on the front of his shoulder. When, there. when somebody has just a general dull ache, there's like, I don't know, it's just kind of all in here. Then I think a close grip is often the way to go. Yeah. And the the other thing I'll use a lot of times I've used this with you know they've got those uh, the old school days in West Side we did we did board presses where we took like a one board or a two board or a three board and now they have these bench blocks and you just take a little it's just like a little like compressed foam block. It's like a yoga block. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you just connect it to the barbell so you don't have to actually have somebody holding like two by sixes on your chest. And you can do a partial range of motion bench press. There's a lot of times people that have pain there in your shoulder, it's just the last inch or two of range of range of motion. So if you if you can remove that, and I like that better than a pin press, pin bench press. So and here's why: on a normal bench press, at the bottom, where does the bar touch? And some of the weight is deloaded in the bottom of bench press into your chest. Now, what I'm always trying to teach with my clients are. I don't want any of the weight to actually deload onto your chest. I want you to basically touch your shirt, but not your chest. Mm-hmm. I want all the weight to stay in your hands. But the reality is with heavy bench presses, that weight gets deloaded onto your chest. If you deload the weight onto pins, onto the catch pins on a, on a squat rack, I don't think it carries over as well to the regular bench press. It's more like a natural bench press with a block on the, on the mm-hmm. bar so it touches your chest and loads the chest like a normal bench press would. Uh, just seems to carry over better. I, I like to pin bench press to train them to stay tight in Me the too. hole. Me uh, too. And 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 how do you know, right? I do the same thing for the squat. You can see how hard that bar hits on the descent. Yeah. And if they if get it loose goes, under bing, it, bing, bing, right? They'll and fail. So, that's right. Because then, because then it's like a bottoms up squat or bottoms up bench press, and that's damn near impossible. So, so uh, Tim Peterson, who was on the mechanic on an earlier episode, he has. Yep. Um, Fragile shoulders and bicep tendons and everything. Lots of uh, lots of slingshot bench presses, some pin presses, lots of floor presses. Yep. I like redu- I want to reduce the range of motion for him yep. uh, when I can. And I you still pause his floor presses. Yeah, uh, yep, yeah. Yep. I like I like a pause floor press yep. too. And uh, you and, know, cl- and, and, fairly, and fairly close grip, probably for everything. Oh, like like a they like look his like press his grip. Press, yeah, yeah. It's there's press grip. Yeah, yeah. Tristan, Tristan says 
can we talk about hemorrhoids? I'm 35, 5'11", and 215. Um, he says, I've been barbell training for four years, and I never had a hemorrhoid in my life until my squat reached 405. His current max is 480 for his squat, 570 for the deadlift. He says, I have great BMs a couple of times daily. I eat about 40 to 50 grams of fiber daily. My brother-in-law used to compete in geared lifting in college, and he says everyone he trained with had hemorrhoids and that they don't go away until you stop heavy lifting. I'm annoyed, uh, but I'm, and I'm not asking for advice. I'm just mostly curious if this happens to most people. And he says, by the way, he is a child psychiatrist, and his favorite episodes are with Dr. Pewter. Hey, go check out Dr. Pewter's podcast. You probably know he has one, uh, but... Go check that one out. You'd probably enjoy it. We'll have yeah. Peter's great. We'll have Psych- a, psychiatry and psychotherapy. Yeah, um, he's my he's my psychiatrist now. I see him. I see him uh, at least on a weekly basis, and I I love seeing the guy. He's great. He ain't yeah. cheap. No, Oof. guys. He's in L.A. Right? Is he in L.A.? Yeah, uh, and I'm in Springfield, account. Missouri, which means he doesn't cost the same thing as really good psychiatrists and psychologists in Springfield, Missouri. Like the best one, the most expensive one is one third the price of pewter. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> so you know, if you if you want you D, if you want DP, you're going to pay. Um, That's right. I do want DP. Hemorrhoids. Um, not everybody gets it when they lift heavy. It's kind of like the no, hernia thing, right? I do. Th- I think so too. I think it's sort of a genetic thing. Um, I never had them for years and years and years, and I think over time the the um the heavy lifting probably did it for me too. So I, I do think it can exacerbate what is probably going to be a problem. Now this is this per, like we can we can stay serious enough with grown ups. Uh, I know because my parents told me later in life that both my parents had them, and my parents have never really been lifters. So it tells me that genetically I was probably predisposed to have them later in life anyway. I will say this another shout out to the bidet. I think the bidet actually, like, if you don't literally waterboard your butt, I think you've got the opportunity to, like, not not um, inflame things down there. Well, sure, if, sure. If you're using if you're using low quality shitty toilet paper, and you've already got you've already got some hemorrhoids, and then you get in there and you just inflame the shit out of those things, not literally but figuratively. I think that you should probably use. A maybe uh, maybe a, a bristle brush and a little something. kerosene, and then if you can you build, need? yeah, if you can build Your up some calluses, some calluses, and it won't be an issue. Yeah, no, that's I, not a bad uh, idea. I, I do think I do think that they are like hemorrhoids are like the hernia, so that if you're if you're prone to have them, you're going to get them, and if you're not prone to, you probably won't. Although people that are squatting four eighty like you are, uh, I think you're going to get. Uh, <laughs> it's probably pretty, probably pretty uh, high, high, high percentage of people that squat 480 um, get probably a little bubble them. butt there. Um, no <laughs> fun. Bubble butt. No fun. Um, I, d- I actually haven't had that that trouble, um, but when I squat heavy, it does feel like my rectum pops out like one of Mr. Crab's eyes. Does it for? I mean, you, are you telling a joker you actually feel pressure in your rectum? Oh, for pressure for sure. See, I don't think I ever have. Well, you know, I fold up so much that I just when I squat, I essentially turn my colon into like a pastry bag. Right, <laughs> and it's all I can do to keep everything inside and not just right. soft serve. Right, I hate Got that. I, now that you know, now that I if if I squat north of three seventy five. It's all I can do to keep everything inside. Right. I hate it. I mean, I've actually pooped myself a few times, but I didn't actually oh. feel it coming until I've actually pooped myself afterwards. I'm like, oh, man, I pooped myself. No, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I lean over so far. I get it on yeah. the bottom of the hole. My bottom rib is touching my thigh. Yeah. And I just... I just... I feel like I hold more pressure cake. in my face. I'm, You know, I'm probably one of those guys that doesn't Valsalva exactly correctly. Hold too much pressure in my cheeks. A little Dizzy Gillespie style. Right. <laughs> and come fire it out. So so I'll blow the blood vessels really heavy. I'll blow blood vessels in my eyelids or in my cheeks just underneath my eyes. I used to blow my eyeballs, but I haven't, I haven't blown my eyes in probably 15 years. I haven't had to burst blood vessel in my eye or anything in quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Here's this question again. It's a legit question. Randall says, I work a 12-hour night shift, three on, three off. I'm trying to figure out the best way to program my workouts, et cetera. What have we said in the past? <laughs> just just do whatever you can do, days. man. Just do whatever yeah, you, you can just, do. You, know, you just turn you turn it up during the days off, and you turn it down during the days you train. I mean, the days you work. So you work. You you probably a little low, like significantly lower volume. Get in, get out, get your work done. And on days that you're off and you get to sleep more and work less, you push a little harder. So it, it wouldn't be that hard if you're three days on, three days off. That uh, you just you just 
I would just train on a six day schedule instead of a seven day schedule. I mean, it sounds like you're living on a six day schedule. There's nothing special about the seven day schedule. It's it's actually a pain in the ass from a programming perspective. It's just yeah. wouldn't it be we easier set it up, with six or eight? Yeah, we set it up on the calendar just because it's the calendar, right? It's a week. But if you're you know you train if if all your days it doesn't really matter to you, you're doing three on three off, three on three off. I would train one time on the days you you're working. Those three on, I would train one time, and I would train fairly heavy and very low volume. And on the three off, I would train twice. Yeah, that and was I would train higher. I would train higher volume and higher stress in general. Yeah, that was a specific question. He said, "Would I be better off with a four day split and I'm training three days in a row on the days off?" And the answer is no. Uh, the first day of your day off, of your three days off, you just stayed up all night, right? Uh, so, so in some ways the first day of your night shift ain't a bad time to work out pretty, pretty vigorously. Right. Um, but listen, man, you're just going to do whatever you can do at the yep. bottom. He says, I, I would just wish I could, you know, work at, work it out like normal people. You can't, you can't. not if that's your job. Yeah, you can't. I, I'm you get sorry. A different job or you can, you can just adjust. That's okay. Yeah. But that low volume, heavy people often do pretty well after work. Uh, after working yep. all night, and then uh, and uh, so you you might do, yeah, that so they they tend to do okay with that, and you can get to, get your volume in on those uh, on those uh, three offs. Meanwhile, you may want to run your four day split over a total of eight or six eight or nine days, because you may not be able to train well for four days a week because of this sure. wackadoo schedule. Uh, just man, just keep going, just yep. keep going. That's the thing. I do a, do you ever do a, um, this is one of those, it, it may be a placebo, but if I'm standing all day, if I'm done something where I've stood on my feet all day and then I have to train, I will always take like a long bath before I train. I've got a great big giant bathtub that I can get into that a 290 pound can get in, but I get off my feet or in hot water, I lay down, it kind of warms up my muscles and lets my feet have a break. And then I get out of the tub and I put my workout clothes on. I go downstairs and train and I can actually train pretty heavy, but pretty low volume. Hmm. But I have a hard time like walking. If I've been on my feet for 10 hours, walking into my closet, throwing my shorts and, and t-shirt on and then walking into the gym and like never getting off my feet. But there's something about if I sit in my chair downstairs, I'm probably not going to train. Hmm. I'm going to sit in my chair and crack open a beer and be like, yeah, I'll just get to it tomorrow. Sure but like instead, if I nap. if I get off my feet and I get in a tub, which sounds weird, you know, like dudes don't really take baths, but I get that big old giant tub. Yeah, I sure like a little nap on. before. I do too. I, li I like a nap too. I, I'm, I'm, there's a more chance of me training if I take a little like 20-minute, 30-minute nap, get off my feet, than if I watch TV for 20 or 30 minutes in, a, in my chair. No TV. Yeah. It's a complete waste. Zach. With a CH. He says, he's been a first uh, a listener since the very first episode. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thanks, man. He says, a few months ago, he convinced his fiance to start strength training, and he started coaching her. She was on a good roll until several weeks ago. She slipped on the stairs at her work and severely bruised her tailbone. Uh, we confirmed via x-ray that it did not break. She tried training about a week af uh, after it happened, but the pain was so much mm. uh, that she could not train for a few weeks. Recently, she has tried training again. However, it is difficult to do an LP on the squat and deadlift uh, because when the weight gets heavy enough, it aggravates her injury to yeah. the point that it's hard to stay tight in the ascent and the entire deadlift movement it's all, uh, itself is painful. What You what ever bruise do? your tailbone? Yes. It sucks. It's terrible. That's one of those horrible... I bruised my tailbone once in a 15-passenger van riding across the country and I so I was trying to sleep so I scooted way forward on the seat mm. and sat on my tailbone rather than on my like sit bones rather than on my mm. ass I was sitting literally on my tailbone like as far forward in the seat as I could and leaned back into the chair and tried to sleep because I was we were on some trip where we were driving through the night or whatever and I woke up the next day and I was like oh my and it had bruised my tailbone from like laying on the you know the front yeah. edge of the bench seat of the 15 passenger van it bruised my tailbone that thing hurt for six weeks eight weeks yeah. I would say that Zach needs to have her back off the weight enormously for lower body stuff. Yes. And just hammer the upper body. Yeah. And and then when you're not training, hammer her lower body too. But no. L lower the weight a lot. You know, and she's going to detrain, but that's okay. You you want to give her tailbone 
um, plenty of room and time to uh, to recover. And yeah. you know, by the time you get back to the stressful weights, hopefully she will have recovered. It's okay. Yeah. There's no good way to rehab that that I know of. To it's like a bruised rib. Yeah, you get a bruised rib. It's a similar thing. Like, dude, it hurts. It hurts. You can't do anything. You can't set a valsalva. And those 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 bruised bone areas are ugh, brutal. A, a, a heel bruise. Ugh. Dude, a heel bruise. I or I like hate I, that. Yeah. I had uh, I've had plantar fasciitis real bad, which is not the same thing as a heel bruise. But man, the bottom of, when the bottom of your feet are horribly painful, especially if you're like me and you deadlift with in your socks, you know, it's like you deadlift and squat and just hurts the bottom of your feet so bad. So it's yeah, it's tough. Look, it's the same thing. Like we deal with a lot of people who have bicep tendonitis, and the tendonitis itself in your bicep probably actually doesn't hinder the lifting. It's just, but it hurts, it hurts. so bad. That it's hard to like just get if all you're doing is thinking about how bad it hurts, it's awfully hard to lift, and it's the same thing. You bend over on a. I'll tell you this: like I probably with a bruised tailbone, I probably have her high bar squat. I'd have her bend over less, you know, maybe front squat. Yeah. Right. So the more you bend over and close the hip, the more you're gonna pull on the back end of that the point of the tailbone. So I just do what I could. Probably have her rack pull so she don't have to bend over as much. You could probably do those things as well. So those are all options. You can do one more? Here's a similar question from Jared. J A R A similar question about a bruised tailbone? No. Okay. Kinda. Jarod. Jarod. Jared. I'm a 41-year-old lifter who has been training seriously for about two and a half years. Early on when I started training, I tore my hip adductor. I rehabbed it, got back into it, and I've gone from a 95-pound squat to well in the mid-400s. And I've even done two powerlifting meets with no re-injury. That being said... Every time I take a heavy squat, I feel tightness in my adductor, and I worry yeah. about injuring it again. Yep. I probably cut sets short that I could have pushed through out of fear of repeated injury. Have you or your clients dealt with that, and how do you work through that apprehension? <laughs> you're screwed, dude. <laughs> I was hoping you had an answer. I mean, you're you know, ask they ask me. I'm the guy that's I'm the guy that's torn both pecs and one really bad. Every time I've ever bench pressed heavy since I've torn my pecs. All I think about is my torn pecs. Super scary, dude. Super you know, scary. You 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 tear a muscle, and you know I'm like you know this. I hate to say this, but you know the 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 greatest. What's the word? How how do we say this? Like the greatest uh, precursor, the greatest the greatest. It foretells future injury is past injury. What's right. the what's the term there? I'm Predicts. screwing that up, but it's the best predictor. You know, yeah, the greatest predict. Yeah, we'll say that. The greatest predictor of future injury is past injury to the same spot. And so, uh, you know, if you've torn your adductor, the, re the reality is, is that you've got some, some actual no shit scar tissue in there, right? Not, yep. not adhesions and bullshit that, that massage therapists think that they can work out, but like you've actually got some things that are not pliable where the, where the sarcomeres, the, 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 the actin and myosin sliding filaments won't actually slide over each other because it's more like plastic than it is like muscle fiber. Which means that there's a chance, since that doesn't slide and it's not pliable, that it's going to go. It's going to tear again at some point. Like that's just the reality of the situation. So, uh, you, I think you would you're fine being a little conservative and probably cutting them off. Look, if you would, if your same email had said, every time I get up to two twenty five, I start to cut the sets off short. Right. Exactly. I'd be like, bro, you're fine. But when you squat in the mid 400s and you're like, you know, I just feel a little pull there. I do this all the time. I bench press and I'm I'm going to bench press, you know, 315 for 12. And I bench press 315 for six or seven. I'm like, that's good for today. And I rack it because that pec starts to go. Mm, I don't think I want to go for all those reps yep. or whatever. And so how, I think it's I think how, how heavy is heavy enough, Matt Reynolds. That's right. How heavy is heavy enough? If you're squatting in the mid fours, you're strong. You're fine. So there yeah. you hear it. I think, it. I think you listen to your body in a situation like that. Again, I think if you've had an injury in the past and you're at 50% of that previous injury and it's months later and everything should be healed, then you just need to, you need to suck it up and train a little harder. But if you're back to the weights that you used when you tore the adductor in the first place, I think you listen to your body. If you, if that adductor, if that adductor is like, nah, don't push. I don't think I'd push. Yeah. There you heard it guys. Matt Reynolds says a 450 squat is strong enough. I think it is. Don't you? Yeah, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, if you, you're the old kid used to train Tim, it was yeah. like a 750 pound squatter. It's probably not strong enough, right? You know, if you're six three and three fifty, 
it's probably not strong enough. But for like your normal average middle aged guy, four fifty squat, that's pretty damn strong. Yep. 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 Is there anything that life throws at you where a four fifty squat is not strong enough to like handle life? If there's something that requires more than a four fifty squat, I need a gun and a cheater bar. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The squats ain't gonna get me out of that. That's right. Yeah. Ah, yeah. there's a good Barbell Logic podcast question and answer session. Send your questions to questions at barbell-logic.com, and we will answer those on a future show. I have only deleted in all the time we've been doing these Q and A's now for almost a full year, I think, and I've only deleted about five questions. Yeah, out of probably what fifteen hundred, hundred, not fifteen hundred, but several hundreds, and uh, the ones I deleted. Most of them were just incomprehensible. It's not that I didn't like the question they or anything. It's like I just like I didn't just, even know what they were saying. It wasn't English. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it was so, supposed to be English, but wasn't English. So your question, if you send it in, we will answer it unless it's gibberish. At some point, sometimes it takes us a little while to get to them, but by golly, we'll get them. And I tell you what, I answer a lot of them like immediately. And, right. But we don't get them on the show. I, I answer them via email. We don't get them on the show for a number of months. But do that. Do that. Send your questions in to questions at barbell-logic.com. Well, there you go. Hey, guys, it's 2020, so best of luck to you and all your training and all of your new initiatives this year. They're not resolutions. Uh, it's just a to-do list for 2020. Action plan. Yeah. Let's Start go, marking let's it go, off. Let's go, do some, let's go do some stuff. Let's be people of action. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. See you guys.